Today, I'm going to be showing you the basics of manual metal art welding. Now, the most important part of any welding installation is obviously the welder. Now, this model here is an Oxford oil-cooled welder. It's got an output of 250 amps maximum and can accept an input of either 230 volts or 400 volts across two, across two phases of a three-phase uh, three supply. It's got a 50 volt output and an 80 volt output. I tend to use the 80 volts because it just makes it that bit easier to strike up. Now, the welder works as follows. It draws its supply here from the mains at 230 volts and it steps it down to either 50 volts or 80 volts. Now, I use the 80 volt output, as I said earlier, because it makes it easier to strike up. And then this end of the torch is live. This is a welding rod, and this is what you use to strike up on your workpiece. It's comprised of a solid inner core of typically 2.5 or 3.2 millimeters. It's got an outer core on this thing, which burns away and produces a shield gas. Now, this is important as it stops it stops oxygen getting to the weld and stops stops the weld fouling up. The workpiece obviously then has to be grounded to complete the circuit, and that's where your earth clamp comes in. Your workpiece always has to be connected back to the welder through your earth clamp, back down here, back down this black wire, back to the welder, which completes the circuit. Now, there are a few tools that you need to start welding. Obviously you need a welder and you need a suitable power supply to power it. You obviously need two leads, a ground clamp and an electrode holder. You also need different types of electrode which we'll come on to for working on different materials. The most basic tool of all though is a welding pounder. Now this one is the most basic type. This one has a liftable and lowerable screen on the thing. You can lift it to see what you're doing and lower it down to do the welding. You can get more fancy ones that are, um, are light activated and that will dim automatically when you strike up. These tend to cost in the re these welding helmets tend to cost in the region about eight to ten pounds. The more expensive ones with the the automatic ones tend to be around the eighty to one hundred pound mark for a decent quality one. You'll also need a wire brush. These are used for cleaning up the welds after you've chipped off the slag. Now, chipping hammers you will also need. I have two here, a wooden handled one and a metal sprung handled one. They both have their advantages and disadvantages. It doesn't matter which one you have. This one's just easier for heavier duty materials. You know, it's got a bit of weight in it. And this one's quite handy for getting into small crevices if you're, say, doing you know, a fillet weld or a butt weld. You will also need a suitable place to do your work. Ideally, a metal vise on a metal bench is the best solution for it. As I said before, you can ground the bench and ground the vise. You only have to clamp your work and you can strike up straight on it. Now, the first thing you want to do when you come to weld is look at the material. This is 8 inch steel, nothing special, just plain mild steel. And say I wanted to fillet weld these two together here. The type of rod I would use would probably be a three, sorry, a 2.5 mil E6013 rod, such as this one. I have a selection here. I don't know whether you can see this on the camera. That is a 2.5 mil rod here in my right hand. That is a 3.2, and that is a 4 mil rod. The two things, that, the main two things, I should say, that determine the current are the thickness of the material and the size of the rod. Now, for something like this, I would probably choose around the 110 mark on my welder. And I'm going to set my welder here to 110 amps. The basic thing is you should try it and see what it sounds like, and experience will show whether you need more or less current. 
Now, I don't want to bang on about safety, but when you do weld, when the flux burns off around the rod, it does give off some quite nasty fumes. So you want to make sure there's an adequate flow of ventilation around the work area. Not too much, because you don't want to blow away these protective gases, because it shields the weld from oxygen. But if you're in a workshop like I am, I've got two big double doors open behind me here out of shot. You want to make sure that there is some sort of ventilation here and you don't do it in too confined space. Once you've selected your rod, you want to take your electrode holder, unscrew your old electrode and insert the correct size for the material you're working on, in this case the 2.5 rod. You want to place the electro holder down, and it's noted that if you place it down here on the grounded bench, when you plug the welder in, make sure it isn't switched on. So I'm checking here that the welder is switched on. I'm now safe to plug it in. So, check the connection is secure. I'm now going to take my welding mask. That can be go on and be adjusted. Now you're ready to switch on. Now, the basic technique for doing a fillet weld is to have the workpiece directly in front of you and you want to always weld with the rod coming back towards you. You want to flick your wrist like that and you want to keep the electrode at about a 45 to 60 degree angle and you always weld coming back towards you in a straight line. Now, I can't obviously show you because I can't, uh, I can't turn down the light enough on the camera, but I'll show you the results afterwards. You can pick up the noises on the camera and tell whether the current is high, too high or too low you know, with experience. So, here it goes. Don't make the mistake of putting this, uh, the electrode down on the bench because remember the bench is grounded. Switch the welder off first. Now you say put the electrode down. Now, as you can see here, the weld is covered with the slag. Now you need the chipping hammer here to break the slag off. Now here's a te here's a, um, a little technique to knowing how how good the weld is. The slag should easily break off. It shouldn't have to be beaten to hell to break the slag off. It should be a couple of light taps should break it off. Like that. The slag should take very little to break off if the weld is good. Now, you want to take your wire brush and you want to just clean off And there you have it, one fillet weld. Now, you don't know really how, how well you could hear on the video, but that's about the right sound you want for the current. You can tell here that the current wasn't too low because the weld didn't bunch up, it's a fairly even coating here, and there isn't too much spatter. These little pimples here of, of metal are called spatter, which is what's thrown out if the, if the welding current's too high. Now, I hope that's a very good uh, explanation for you on, uh, on welding, and uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. The welder struck up very easily in the video. You shouldn't, have, you shouldn't find that the electrode sticks to the workpiece. If it does, the most common cause of that is a bad ground, which basically means the, the, um, the path of electricity back to the welder isn't good enough. Now on here, this piece is resting on the work surface here. It's got quite a bit of surface area, but always check the connection to the ground and your connections on the welder if your work piece, if the electrode starts to stick to the work piece and it's hard to strike up. Have fun!